Good morning. Good morning. It's not snowing. I'm beginning not to believe our weathermen. No snow here. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yet. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open. We're going to look in uh, Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 2. So kind of put your finger in those, put a bookmark there. We're going to kind of bounce back and forth. A um, number of things that I want to share with you today. Um, if you would uh, put that first slide up, please. <clears throat> Last week we talked about what? Does anybody remember? Hanukkah. Hanukkah, Hanukkah the festival of lights, the feast of dedication. Uh, Jesus actually celebrated this, uh, which I, I found ironic because here he is, the light of the world, celebrating the festival of lights. Um, his birth was announced by a star that shone brightly and by angels that came and the glory of God shone around them. And here he is going up to celebrate the Festival of Lights while he is the light of the world. And so um, this season we celebrate our, you know, we have our Christmas tree and our decorations and there's not many lights on that tree. Um, and there's a gift. And we often, at this time, I'm, I'm going to read the Christmas story, and I'm actually going to read it, I'm going to jump back and forth between Matthew and Luke. So you'll have to kind of keep up with me here. I'm going to read the story first, and I'm going to go back and I want to point some things out to you. So we're going to start off in Matthew, chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to start off in 1, uh, verse 18. No, I've changed my mind. Let's start with Luke. That's why I told you to keep your finger in both places. Okay, we're going to back up. I need to set the stage a little bit, okay? Luke chapter 1. Luke explains to Theophilus, who there's, there's quite a bit of debate, is Theophilus an actual person? Or is it actually a people group? Because Theophilus in the Greek means lover of God. Okay, one who loves God. So was Luke actually writing to a specific person whose parents just happened to give him that name? Or is he writing to any that love God? All right? And he explains in his opening statement uh, what he's doing. I'm, I'm writing this so that you will know with certainty these things that have happened. Okay? Um... I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit about what's going on. Um, this is in the days of Herod. This is Herod the Great. Okay? We talked about him a couple months ago. He wasn't great because he was a great king. He was a horrible ruler. He was a despot. He had uh, one of his wives and one of his children put to death in order to further his own ends. But he was an incredible architect, an incredible builder. And he was a friend of Rome. Um, so this Herod, he's ruling. And it says there's a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife, Elizabeth, that could not uh, bear children. Okay? Um, and it's interesting, the, the wife, it specifies, was a daughter of Aaron. Okay, so both sides of John's parents were coming from the priesthood, okay? And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. I love when the Bible speaks euphemistically. They're both advanced in years. That's a, that's a, a very pleasant way for saying they were elderly. 
or as the young people say, they were old. <laughs> the older you get, the less old old is, isn't it? <laughs> you know? I remember looking at my parents when they were my age and thinking, wow, that is old. <laughs> How do they function? <laughs> Um, now, while he was serving as priest, this being Zechariah, before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Okay? So, all of a sudden, we have something beyond the norm, okay? Now, we see that Zechariah and Elizabeth are righteous, and he's going in to do his duty. The, the lot fell to him to go and burn the incense, and an angel appears. And now, and now we go back to a euphemism here. And Zechariah was troubled, you think? I don't know about you guys, but if I come into the church and I'm praying, or I'm, I, don't, I, I probably wouldn't be burning incense, but an angel popped up on the stage, I think I would be troubled. Okay? And so he was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. It's that same fear that we talked about with the shepherds. It's something far beyond our comprehension. Okay? And the angel said to him, do not be afraid. I think it's really cool when the angels appear and the first thing they do is reassure you. Don't be afraid. Because sometimes they don't. Okay? Sometimes they say, don't say, don't be afraid. That's when you really need to be afraid. <laughs> okay? So, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Okay? And I'm, I'm just going to kind of skip down here because he basically tells him that he is going to be the, the predecessor, the forerunner to the Messiah. He's going to be the one that proclaims the coming of the Messiah. Okay? Um, and then Zechariah said to the angel, uh, How's this going to happen? Look at me, I'm advanced in years. And my wife, now see, I like the way Zechariah is very tactful, because he doesn't mind admitting, I'm old, and my wife is advanced <laughs> in years. And this guy knew how to play it, right? <laughs> and the angel said, I am Gabriel. Now this is one of two angels in all of scripture that are actually given a name. What's the other angel that is given a name? Michael. Michael. And then there was a third angel that actually had a name and fell and became the devil. And he was called Lucifer. And, and the three of those, we believe those three made up the, the archangels. Okay? Those that were nearest to God. All right? So, um, Gabriel is never mentioned as being an archangel, but because he's named, that gives him significantly more relevance than those that did not have names, okay? So, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Now, we have something on here, because this next thing, Zechariah has a right to be afraid. He, he's showing wisdom in being afraid, because the angel says, and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled at their time. Okay, you're not going to be able to talk anymore. You, you doubt? Because what Zechariah say, how shall I know this? Oh yeah, how is this going to happen? We're old. Well, I'm old. She's advanced. <laughs> and because of his doubt, he's not going to be able to talk. And, and evidently there was something beyond his inability to talk because when John is born, as we'll see a little bit later, um, they actually have to try and communicate with him. What do you want the boy's name to be? 
Okay, so there's, there's something evidently more than just being unable to talk. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple, probably because he's advanced. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Okay? And when this service was ended, he went home, and um, euphemistically, he knew Elizabeth, and she conceived... Then we jump down to verse 26. In the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Elizabeth's pregnancy. Okay? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And I find it funny that they call it a city. Having been there and seen that the entire city is now underneath one Catholic church. The entire city of Nazareth is underneath one church. Okay? So, he goes to this city uh, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, their process of marriage was very, very different than ours. Alright? So, they would have actually a twofold process of marriage. The first, uh, after the father would negotiate the bride price. The, the fathers would discuss, and if the bride did not have a father, he would talk to the nearest male relative, usually an uncle, and they would determine what, what was going to transpire. The, the fathers would agree. There was a, a sharing of the cup at the betrothal service. If the woman drank from the cup, she accepted the betrothal. If she did not, she didn't. What a bummer would that be? Hey, guys, we're having a party to celebrate my betrothal. Oops. <laughs> kind of like being stood up at the altar. Okay? But in the eyes of all, they were married at the point of betrothal. But then there was the time of preparation where he would go and he would build the house and build a place to bring his wife when they were actually, by our understanding of it, married. Okay? And so, now, typically, in the culture at that time, his house was not a standalone unit. Most often, it was actually built onto his father's house. And so you'd have these rambling structures where there would be a, a central area, and then there'd be like clumps of houses built off of them, which is important because you need to understand the significance of that when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He's talking as the bridegroom would speak to the bride. Okay, we're betrothed, and I'm going to prepare a place and then at the wedding, you will come with me to that place. Okay? So it's significant that we understand what the betrothal is. So they are betrothed. They're like married A. And then married B comes at the actual wedding ceremony when she, he takes her back to his house. Okay? And uh, she was betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled. Another euphemism? I, uh, I, I would like to see what greatly troubled looks like. Because to me, greatly troubled doesn't really convey the idea that I think I would have if I saw an actual angel of the Lord in revealed glory. Um, and she said... Uh, she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Well, yeah. If an angel appeared to you and said, your favor? Hmm. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Or Yeshua. Okay. Now, you understand that Jesus is not the name that people called him when he was alive and in his ministry and in his life. They didn't say, oh, hey, Jesus, what's up? They probably didn't even say, what's up? <laughs> the, this is actually a rendering from Hebrew to Greek to English, and, and along the way kind of picked up a little bit of Latin. And so where we get Jesus, and, and in the Latin languages it's... it's Jesus, 
it actually is from Yahshua, okay? And so, um, you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's kind of heavy stuff. Don't you think? Uh, you know, here's Mary, probably somewhere between 14 and 16 years old. And an angel appears to you and says, hey, God's favored you, and he's going to give unto you a son that is going to reign forever. Okay? And Mary said, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. Now, I always found it interesting, because here she's asking a question that sounds very similar to what Zechariah asked, and Zechariah struck mute. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, let's back up for just a second. Let's look at that word holy. Remember what our definition of, of, of holy is? It's set apart. Okay? Set apart unto God. It's holy. It's not profane. It's not common. It's not ordinary. It's holy. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age... Boy, the angel doesn't mix it up, does he? <laughs> There's no, no euphemisms there. You say, yeah, you know the, the old cousin you got? <laughs> Has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And I, you know, I, I am perplexed. Why was Zechariah punished and Mary was not? And really what I think it has to lie in is the intent behind the question. Okay? Zechariah was challenging the angel to something that he believed could not happen. Mary was asking for insight as to how it could happen. And I think it's more, more along probably the way that it was said and the intent behind saying it than the actual words. Because uh, Zechariah says, how shall I know this? Mary says, how will this be? He struck mute and she's blessed. Okay? Now, and, and this is one thing, folks, that we really need to get a hold of. Um, while we were in Israel, we got to see the Church of Mary's Ascension. Say what now? The church where, according to Catholic tradition, she ascended to heaven. Um, the Catholics put a lot of emphasis on Mary, the Holy Mother, the intercessor between man and Jesus, who is the intercessor between man and God. The Protestants have really denigrated Mary to, I think, almost an offensive position. Okay? God found favor in Mary. He gave favor to her. Among all of women, from Eve to baby Adeline, that's my new <coughs> youngest born, he chose one, and he chose Mary. Now, we can look at, at some of the things that, that the mystological and, and garbage that kind of has been lumped onto Mary. And you need to understand, that was not her doing. First, God chose her. God gave her favor. And then the church, the Catholic church, and by that I don't mean specifically the Catholic church as we know it, I mean the universal church, took that and made it something more than it was. And, they, and by making it more, they actually made it less. Okay? So when you think about Mary, don't think about the, you know, the weird statue and, and people praying Holy Mary and Mother of God and, and all of that. Don't, set, set that to the side and stick with what the Scripture says. Because she found honor before God. Okay? Something none of us have in that way. So... Kind of get a right understanding 
uh, the, the blessing that Mary was given and, and through which we receive. Okay, so in those days Mary arose, I'm in, in verse 39, and she went in haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. She went to go see her cousin. Okay, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Okay, so now we've kind of laid the background here a little bit. Okay? Not one, but two miraculous pregnancies. Okay? Because, you know, John suffers quite a bit in the limelight of Christ. And that's kind of as it should be, because Christ is the Lord. But John was a unique individual, unique among all people. Okay? The way he was conceived is kind of the same fulfillment as Esau. Remember, everything in the Old Testament has its completion or fulfillment in the New Testament. And as Abraham and Sarah were not able to conceive, and they were advanced in years, and God promised them a son, and, and um, Isaac came out of that, okay, the child of, of promise, Isaac. And then we go to the New Testament, and Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth are not able to conceive, and God gives them a child, but this child is the one that is going to carry with him the spirit of Elijah, okay, and he's the forerunner. He's the, the guy that goes before the king and blows the trumpet to get everybody's attention to let him know the king is coming. Okay? So John is, is an incredible figure of all men that were born men and not being the theophany, the God-man. He is unique. Okay? Now, so we have two miraculous pregnancies and uh, we, we have the birth of John and when he's born, they wait eight days to have him circumcised. And then on the eighth day, they say, well, what, what shall we call his name? We're, and I don't know how this works in, in Jewish society, but they were going to name him Zechariah. And his mother says, no, his name will be John. That wasn't sufficient for them. They had to go ask the dad. You know, in the hospital, I, half the time, I wasn't even there when Christy put the name down for our sons or our daughter. They didn't ask me. They didn't care about my opinion. <laughs> but they, you know, she is getting ready. The, the boy is going to be circumcised. And they say, okay, we're going to name him Zechariah. She says, no, no, no. His name's going to be John. Yeah, we'll see about that. Nobody in your family's named John. All right? That's, that's not even a family name. So they go. And, and uh, what I was talking to you a little bit about earlier, um, <clears throat> Verse 62, and they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. So evidently there was something more than Zechariah just couldn't talk, because they were making signs. Do you guys ever do that when somebody's a, a, a little bit um, hard of hearing? You, you start talking with your hands? You know? And so they're making signs. It doesn't say he was deaf. But evidently there was something that was going on, and so he wrote out, his name is John. Okay? And so John is born, and Zechariah speaks a word of prophecy. When you have a chance, read that. Don't skip over that. That's very much a part of the Christmas story, because it's him prophesying over what's coming with the birth of Christ. Okay. So, we're up to chapter 2. Okay? Okay? Luke chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. Okay, now I'm going to back up here to Matthew, okay, 
um, because we need to pick up a little bit what happened in the interim here. So we're going to uh, Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to pick up in verse 18. Okay? Now keep your finger over in Luke 2 because we're coming back. Now the birth of Jesus Christ... By the way, do you, do you understand Christ is not his name? You know, we almost do it like it's a first and last name. Yeah, this is Jesus Christ. That's his title. Okay? It, 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 it's... it's the fulfillment of who he is. He is the anointed one. The one that God has anointed to take away the sins of the world. It's like uh, there were a number of people that were called Messiah, that were called Christ. Christ is just the Greek for the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed one. But there's only one Messiah with a capital M or Christ with a capital C. And this is the one that God has anointed directly. Okay? And so, when, uh, now this is, uh, the birth of Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now talk about a step of faith. Okay? Um, she's got to explain to Joseph what's going on. She's got to explain to everybody what's going on. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. What's interesting about this is this shows a tremendous amount of love on Joseph's behalf for the person of Mary. Because it wasn't just a matter of divorcing her publicly. What should have happened to her? Yeah. And he would have been the first one to throw the stone. Okay? So it's not just a matter of, okay, well, you know, we're going to get divorced, you go your way, and I'll go mine. He's keeping this quiet and protecting her. And, and along with that, you know what had to come with that is people were, were probably looking cockeyed at Joseph, thinking, uh huh, yeah, you guys did the deed, and you just don't want to own up to it. Okay? Because, oh, you're betrothed, but you're not married. So. You, you have all the responsibilities, but none of the privileges. And so, Joseph says, he's going to divorce her quietly. Keep everything low. Okay? So he is showing a tremendous amount of love toward Mary, because it was his right, and, and actually, according to the law, his duty to call that out and stone her. Okay? So... <clears throat> But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay. Men, I want you to look at Joseph as an example. Because he is doing what he knows to be right according to the law. And he's trying to find the best way in which to be both just and merciful. Okay? And he's doing it out of his own reasoning. And God steps in. Now it's interesting, both Zechariah and Mary had an angel actually show up. But Joseph, it speaks to him in his dream. Okay? Um... And the angel says, don't fear. What's happening is by God's will. The Holy Spirit has birthed this child in her, has conceived the child in her. Don't worry. So Joseph wakes up, and he does as directed. Joseph is one of the unsung heroes of the Bible. Because here is a man 
who takes by faith what he has in a dream and applies it to the rest of his life. Okay? You, you have got to know that he had to have doubt. Well, I know it wasn't me, but she's pregnant. There's only one way to get pregnant in this life until now. And he had to live with that for the rest of his life. He had to live with the fact that his son, the firstborn that was of his children, of his wife's children, was not his, but was God's. Wow. Talk about an unsung hero. Because the most anybody ever sees of Joseph is a little statue that stands by the little, you know, manger scene. People don't think about him much. But as much as God chose Mary, he chose Joseph. Okay? So, they called his name Yeshua. Okay, so now we're going to jump back to Luke chapter 2. <coughs> So the census goes out, and Joseph packs up Mary, and they go from Nazareth, and they go up to Jerusalem. And, and I'll tell you, I've seen that country. That was not an easy journey for anyone, much less someone that's nine months pregnant. And they take off, they go, they go to Bethlehem so that he can register in his hometown. And while they were there, we're going to pick up here in uh, verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapping him in swaddling cloths, lay him in a manger, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, Something we need to get right. We have these westernized idea of what's going on here. And we see Mary coming into this city with uh, being pregnant and on a donkey. And Joseph's leading the donkey. And they come in and they go up to the Holiday Inn and knock on the door. And the, the inn manager opens the door and says, oh, we're booked. Sorry, you're going to have to go somewhere else. So they go to Super 8. And Super 8, yeah, don't you hear? There's a convention in town. We're booked. You gotta go. That's not what happened. Okay, the, the word that they use here does not actually convey the idea of an inn as we think. The, the, the idea here is actually a guest room. Okay, and you need to understand, people had family visiting all the time. And they would have a room set aside for the guests to sleep in. Well, when you have a family that has descended from David, because everybody that descended from David has to go to Bethlehem to register, the rooms are going to get full quick. And when you have a wife that's nine months pregnant, you're not going to be one of the first ones there. So they show up, and the guest house is, the guest room is, is being used. So they, they put them in uh, where the animals were kept. Now, this is not a stable. Uh, chances are it was not a cave or a wooden stable like you have on your your nativity scene at home, chances are the people actually had a two-story structure and the bottom part of the structure was where they kept their animals. They'd bring them in at night to keep them safe from the animals and from wandering off and, and things like that. And then they would sleep upstairs and the animals would sleep downstairs. So when they came, they came to probably, what most likely was a relative of Joseph's in some manner and said, hey, can you put us up? We're here for the... And they said, well, you know, the guest room is, you know, your cousin Louie was here first, and, and he's already got the room. And they've got seven kids, so guest room is full. But, you know, you can sleep downstairs. It's warm. It's dry. Um, you know, the cow doesn't snore. So you can, and then she gave birth, and chances are they were not alone, just Joseph and Mary and the baby. There were probably there people there to help her with the birthing process. And then being laid in a manger, um, you know, there's a, this idea that it was this little wooden structure with a bunch of hay in it. Well, chances are it was probably made of stone, and it was a feeding trough for the animals, and they probably put 
straw in there to keep the baby warm and laid the baby in there. And, and this makes a perfect bed. He's not going to get stepped on by the animals. He's not going to get rolled over on by the non-snoring cow. And so they put him in a safe place. So we need to kind of shift our thinking a little bit away from Western Christmas. Okay? So the, the being turned away, it wasn't like they came to the, the innkeeper. And the innkeeper said, oh, there's no room here. You've got to go somewhere else. They came to family. And family said, wow, we're, we're packed. But there's room here. You, you guys can stay here. Okay? And so um, Jesus is born. Okay? Now, first, before we move on into the story, let's talk a minute about <coughs> where Jesus was born. Now, I'm not talking about the physical location. We, we've already spent time talking about that, what the, the guest room and the, the manger. But here he is, the sovereign creator of everything. I mean, think about this. This baby that is being born made his mom and dad. It was by his word that they came to be. He made the animals that were sheltering there. He made all the people that didn't have enough room to put them in the guest room. He made all the material that the house was made of. He made the straw that they then laid him in. All of this was made by him. He is the king of of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no one greater than him. Why a manger? I mean, think about this. He's of the line of David. It's prophesied that he will take his father David's throne and he will rule on it forever. And he's born in a manger. You know, I mean, in the stable and with the animals. When Jesus walked in his ministry years later, he actually offended the, the elite, the, the rich and the powerful and the noteworthy, because he didn't go to them. Who did he go to? He went to those who had need. <clears throat> okay? And over and over in his life, people would say, why are you there? On, on at least two occasions, they questioned why he was in a particular house. In the first case, he said, I, I came to the sick. The people that are well don't need a doctor. It's the people that are sick. I'm coming to the sick. And, and in another case, he said, I, I'm coming to seek and save the lost. Okay? Now, I believe, personally, that Jesus was born in a stable and laid in a manger because there is no pretense there. He, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't even laid in a crib made of wood. He didn't even get that much. He was the lowest of the low. <clears throat> and I believe that he chose that manner to be born so that we would always understand how approachable he is. Okay? I believe that he humbled himself to the point that even the lowest of the low in our lives, in our culture, in our society, let's, let's, step, out, let's step outside of the U.S. Because really in the United States, what we call poor is not poor. Let's look at um, Africa. I have a friend who is a videographer for <coughs> Feed the Children. And he recently <coughs> took a round the world trip. And he stopped in Africa and he actually has this picture of this beautiful little boy looking out of a window of a, a mud hut. And the boy looked at him and he smiled and, and David took a picture, he's an incredibly gifted artist. And he took a <coughs> photograph of this boy and the boy looked at him and he said, you have to be rich. And David thought, I'm not rich. So I, you know, I only make X amount of dollars a year. I struggle to put my kids in college. I'm, you know, and then he started looking at what this little boy had, and it was like God just kind of opened his eyes and he said, "I realize just how rich I am." And so let's let's not look at our idea of poor, 
where somebody has food stamps to get their food. Let's look at the idea of poor where somebody has nothing with which to get food. Okay. Let's look at that little African boy in the window that really the window all it was was a hole in a mud wall. And he looks out and, and he sees somebody that because he's wearing blue jeans and a, and, and a shirt, he thinks that person's rich. Okay. Let's look at that kind of poor. That boy can easily understand the boy born in a stable. There's no way that boy could understand a boy born in a palace. Okay? Now, we look and, and we say, oh, you know, we've got hospitals and we've got all these things to, to make. I mean, you, in America, you have your choice. You can have your baby in a hospital, a birthing center, a midwifery. With wife, wife, what one of those places? Wifery? What's a wifery? Wifery. You can have your baby at home. If you do, I don't want to know about it. Okay. Um, you have choices, but for the most of the world, there is no choice. You, you just got what's there. So, I believe that when Jesus came, He chose. It was the Father's plan and purpose to make him, from the moment he got here, approachable. No pretense. Okay? Now, that's hard for me to really wrap my brain around, because here is God in the flesh. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about giving thanks and, and giving thanks for what's coming. Streets of gold so pure that it's clear. Gates made of a single pearl. And this is where he's coming from. This is the type of thing that he's used to. And he comes, and he's born in the lowest of the low. He has done so, so that we have no excuse. We can't look and go, oh, well, you know, he had it easy. Look at that. I mean, he was born into a palace. He was born with, the, with all that, that life had to offer. No. He was born with next to nothing. He was born on vacation in a place that was not home. So when you look at the Christmas story, you have to think about the why. Not just the what. Okay? We look at Christmas as kind of an end. Yay, the present has arrived! And that's, that's why I have that present up there. Okay? Um, because we're all looking to the present. And yet, really, the present isn't that little baby lying in a manger. If you would go ahead and advance it. See, this is what the present is. That's why that baby came. That baby didn't come for a hoochie coochie good feeling moment. <clears throat> Isn't he so cute? Laying in the straw. He came for one purpose. One purpose. That was that he would die in our place. We look at the angels singing, and by the way, did you know that the angels didn't sing? The word never says they sang, it says they said, glory to God in the highest. Okay? We look at the, you know, the cute little manger with the angel perched over the top of a wooden stable, and we look at them wearing the nice flowing robes and their, you know, babies up white and laying all pudgy and happy and, yeah, and we go, Merry Christmas! This is what Christmas is really about, though. Okay? Don't lose sight of the joy. Okay? Don't lose sight of the joy, the peace, the excitement, because this is where we're going. But this is not where we end. Okay? Because the cross is simply the passageway whereby we depart this life and enter into the life that he has called us to. Okay? But you can't get there without the cross. There's no way 
to God except the cross. And if you try and approach him in any other way, you approach him with the full burden of your sin on your own shoulders. The only way that you can unburden that sin is at the cross. Okay? And when you celebrate Christmas this year, whether you do it Christmas Eve or Christmas morning or Christmas night, whatever, because everybody has different traditions. Before you open a single present, I challenge you, stop. I'm even going to encourage you. Celebrate communion. You, you don't need me to celebrate communion. Celebrate communion because the gift, capital G, is the cross. Okay? Because if Jesus was born and lived his life and did great miracles and had great teaching and died a natural death, we would still be stuck in our sins. We would be caught. We would be trapped. But he was born for one purpose, that at the right time, when everything was right, when God had positioned everything exactly the way that he wanted, he came, he lived, he ministered, he shed his blood on our behalf, and he died in our place. And then three days later, rose again. So when you're getting ready to open your presents and, and start your festivities, and I'm not saying don't, by all means do, but do with the right understanding of what we're celebrating. Okay? Without his death, the birth would be meaningless. Okay? So take a little bit of time. Pause and reflect. Spend a little bit of time in the Word. Read the Christmas story with the understanding of what it's pointing to. Okay? And then celebrate with the full understanding of what you're celebrating. Because we have a lot to celebrate. And it's far beyond ribbons and wrappings and paper and presents and gifts and fruitcake. It's way beyond that. Okay? So don't by any means think I'm saying, oh, don't celebrate Christmas. As a matter of fact, I'm telling you, celebrate it more. <clears throat> celebrate beyond what America tells us is a good Christmas. Take the time to understand the significance of this event. Because this is a huge marker on the road to the cross. And the cross is a huge marker on the road to eternity. Okay? Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Next week we're going to talk a little bit about the three wise guys. <laughs> you know? Cousin Tony, Cousin Vinny, and Cousin Louie. <laughs> you got your names, I got mine. All right? Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, for the birth of your son. And Father, I repent that sometimes I get so caught up in the goings-on, the cultural distractions. I ask, Lord God, that you would set in our hearts and our minds what it is that we're celebrating, why we celebrate. <coughs> Father, give us new revelation this year. Give us words to speak, to share with those around us why we are celebrating. It's not just about the tinsel and the trees, the packages and presents, the food and the fellowship. It's about the great hope that we have. Because not only was your son born, but your son died. And he was born for the specific purpose of dying. And I ask, Lord God, that we would renew our, our devotion to you in this season. That we would not be distracted. That we would celebrate with a right understanding of what we're celebrating. And we bless you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.